1. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Welcome to Geno Zoo. How can I help you? Yes, I'm interested in coming to the zoo with three visitors from Japan. I know you've got all the animals, but my guests would really like to get up close to the animals, something different and unique. Do you offer special tours? As a matter of fact, we do. We offer three tours. We have our Snakes Unlimited tour, we have a Birds Galore tour, and we also have a special behind-the-scenes tour which takes you to our animal hospital where you get to see all the injured animals and how we look after them. Oh, right. Well, one of the girls is studying to be a vet, so I think the behind-the-scenes tour would probably appeal to her. I think Tomo would like to hold a snake and the birds sound fascinating too. Tell me, is it possible to do all three tours? Yes, actually it is. The Snakes Unlimited Tour kicks off at a quarter past ten and goes for an hour. The second tour with the birds start at around noon and the last tour happens at half past two. So it is possible to do all the tours during your visit to the zoo. Great. Now, the only thing I want to know is how much does all this cost? Well, let's see. The admission price is fifteen ninety five, and the tours are extra. If you're interested in the snakes tour, it's going to cost five fifty, but that price includes being able to hold a python. The birds tour is where you get to hold an adult eagle. That one costs six fifty, and um, I think the third tour costs nine fifty. Yes, and you get to hand feed the baby kangaroos. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. <laughs> yes, well, it sounds like a lot of fun. I think my guests will be really interested in all three of the tours. I'm unfamiliar with the layout of the zoo. Tell me, where do we need to meet for the first tour? Well, all the tours, in fact, leave from the same spot, and that is just beside the cafe. Okay. Now, as I said, they're from Japan, so English is not their first language. Is there anyone there that could help with translation if we need it? Yes, there is an interpreter, but unfortunately she isn't available for all the tours, so they'll have to ask her any questions they may have after the tour. All the tours are given in English. I'm sure you'll find that the information will be readily understandable for your guests. Okay, then. As you know, everything is outdoors, apart from the third tour, so you might want to tell your guest to bring a hat and some sunscreen. Thanks for the tip. You've been very helpful. Bye. You're welcome. See you at the zoo. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a director of student administration from Mitchford University giving a talk on open day. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17.
Hello to you all. Thank you for coming to Mitchford University's Open Day. My name is Jackie Alford, and I'm the Director of Student Administration. I must begin by passing on some late-breaking news. For the second year running, Mitchford University has been the winner of the prestigious Distance Education Award. As an online university, we are thrilled with this and thank our excellent staff for their dedicated work. We now add this trophy to our Research Excellence Award. The only one remaining is the best overall university, which we are expecting to be announced in the near future. Now, I want to cover a few aspects of what we offer our students from the student administration point of view. I would like to cover a few of the core things we deal with here at the university. Our office is always busy. Firstly, we handle all requests for on and off campus housing. First year bachelor's degree students, we offer any and all assistance. If you're considering a postgraduate degree with us, which some of you uh, coming to the area with families are, I've met some of you already, I think. Please be aware that due to staff constraints, we are only able to help international students. My department is also responsible for the collection of all student fees and, aside from exam week, we often assist with timetabling. Our department is in close contact with enrollment, so we know all your examination results. Student fees are used to help with the extracurricular activities here on campus. Each semester we put on a movie night, and last year we tried a music appreciation night which was well received. We often invite a number of local charities in the area to participate in our movie nights. This has been a good way for us to give back to some of the local people. Now when you apply for a place at Mitchford University, your application package goes first to the registrar's office where it is either accepted or rejected based upon your past academic record and test results. If you are accepted, it comes to the Student Administration Department, where we examine any special requests you may have included in your application. After that, a letter is sent to you informing you of your acceptance. The whole process takes about three to four weeks. Generally, if we receive applications by April or early May, students are notified of their acceptance in late June, unless you make mistakes with your application, which is all too common. Before listening to the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Yes, there are things we ask you not to do. Some people forget important information, believe it or not, and we get this most often. Some applicants forget to include a forwarding address. We can't send anything back to them. Another big one is forgetting to include past academic records. Hey, please don't forget them. We've had minor problems with people forgetting to include the processing fee, which stands at $45. Still others leave off the compulsory picture of themselves. Oh, yes, and perhaps the most common mistake people make is sending the application to the incorrect address. Please send the application to our post office box address. Okay, that's enough for me. Any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between students about a university assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26.
Well, as you know, we have to plan and conduct a survey. How should we organise this? Well, I think we should divide up the task and then assign them to people who want to do them. I think that's a good idea. I don't want to talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, if we divide up the tasks, no one will feel as though they are doing all the work. Even distribution, it's fair. I've done it this way before and it's always worked out quite well. Yes, I agree, but what if some tasks are longer than others? Then it doesn't seem fair. Well, then we have to make sure we divide the tasks up according to time estimates. Some tasks may take longer, for example, the interview stage, and others shorter, like perhaps the layout of the survey form. OK then, Carol. That sounds like a great idea. I seem to recall reading somewhere in our lecture notes that dividing up tasks was highly recommended for group work, so I feel good about what we're doing. OK then, what are the tasks and who wants to do them? Well, at the moment... I'm studying layout and design, so if nobody has any objections, I'd like to work out the design of the survey. I'll have this finished by mid-March, the 23rd to be exact. I've got other assignments to do around that time. That's fine with me. I hate design and layout. What about organising the questions? Someone's going to have to do this. Could I? I promise to be all finished by mid-March. What do you think, Carol? Yes, that all sounds good. I guess someone's going to have to do the questioning. Why don't I conduct the survey? The assignment is due on April the 3rd, so I will have the survey completed by late March, just in time for the oral report. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Yes, about that oral report, does anyone have any notes from last lecture? There were some good ideas about how to give a good oral report. Yes, I happen to have them right here. There were some very helpful suggestions given by Professor Thompson. Should we take a moment to go through them? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes please. Well, firstly, the report itself is due after the survey has been handed in. I believe our group will be presenting it on the 12th of April. 12th of April? That's the date of my counting exam. Anyway, Professor Thompson said we mustn't speak longer than 20 minutes, or less than 15. He said when it comes to assigning grades, he will be looking for speakers to maintain eye contact with the audience. In other words, don't just stand up and read the presentation. That's been my problem in the past. I spend all my time looking at my notes and the audience gets bored. Yes, that's right. Another point to remember is to make good use of gestures. Standing there like a robot is also very boring for the class. Another thing to consider is visual aids. He said we should include a variety of them, things like overhead transparencies, handouts. We can use the whiteboard. DVDs or video were also suggested. OK, let's decide who wants to do what. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk by a university lecturer about the Aboriginal language of Australia. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. We'll begin our course of study this semester 
by looking at the role of the English language among the native or indigenous peoples of Australia. Aboriginal English, as it is often referred to, was described by one linguist as the first and most significant dialect of Australian English. Over the years there has been much research in the continent of Australia concerning the use and types of Aboriginal English. Some linguists have suggested that there were literally hundreds of languages spoken by the indigenous or Aboriginal people. European settlers who came to the continent of Australia brought with them their own language and this was adopted by the Aboriginal people. As a result, many of the languages used by the Aboriginals died off. I should mention that in Central Australia, white settlement began comparatively late, with the setting up of the Overland Telegraph Station near Alice Springs in the 1860s. For the Aboriginal people of Central Australia, the coming of the white man to the area had a negative impact upon their culture and language. However, Despite their domination, a number of central Aboriginal language groups managed to survive quite well. Today, the two main language groups in the area are Waropiri and Ararenti, also known as Arunta. These dialects are spoken only in remote areas of the continent. These areas include the Kimberleys, Arnhem Land, Far North Queensland and Central Australia. The two major language groups, Walpiri and Ararenti, are both estimated to have well over 3,000 fluent speakers. Another Aboriginal dialect, known as the Western Desert Language, is spoken by a large group of some 5,000 speakers, extending over a 25,000 square kilometre area of Central Australia. So just how many languages were in use by these people? It's difficult to say conclusively, but some linguists have suggested as many as 260, while others quote a more conservative figure of around 200. Regardless of the actual number, there have been many forms of communication among the Aboriginal people, a people who comprise approximately 2% of the current 20 million strong Australian population. It's interesting to note that many Australians refer to Aboriginal languages as dialects, thinking that they are all dialects of one all-embracing Aboriginal language. This is actually incorrect. In fact, all of the original estimated 250 languages were mutually incomprehensible, as different from each other as, for example, German and French. Aboriginal society does, however, provide frequent examples of bilingualism, with some people speaking several languages and dialects. In actual fact, a number of the languages spoken by Indigenous Australians are themselves actually variations of English. A number of these languages have a great deal in common with English, but have their own distinctive words and meanings, as well as accents and grammar. The Aboriginal people view their language as a way to maintain their unique identity within Australian culture. Of those languages studied, about 20 are still being used today. However, as the older generations die off and are replaced by the younger, even these 20 are in danger of being lost. The others, they've all but been destroyed. They remain unused but live in the memories of the elderly. In some cases, they are trying to be revived by indigenous communities. In order to do so, the youth must learn to take a greater interest in their cultural heritage, or knowledge of these languages will go to the graves with those who knew them. If we don't act now to preserve these languages, an element of history will be lost forever. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
You're never gonna make it, you're not good enough There's a million other people with the same stuff You really think you're different, man, you must be kidding Think you're gonna hit it, but you just don't get it It's impossible, it's not probable, you're irresponsible Too many obstacles, you gotta stop it, yo You gotta take it slow, you can't be a pro Don't waste your time no more Who the fuck are you to tell me what to do? I don't give a damn if you say you disapprove I'm gonna make my move, I'm gonna make it soon And I'll do it cause it's what I wanna fucking do Cause all these opinions and all these positions They come in in millions, they blocking your vision But no, you can't listen, that shit is all fiction Cause you hold the power you're as long as you're driven make it there's no way that you make it And maybe you can fake it But you're never gonna make it Are you just gonna take that? Make them take it all back Don't tell me you believe